Hello and welcome to The Varietal Show. My name is Rory. If you've never been here before, well, this is a show about sort of chilling out for an hour, talking about stories, but more so creating stories together and just, you know, trying to find something good in the day. Um, so if you like storytelling and you want to hang around and help us tell a story over the next about an hour, usually one that's a little silly, then you're in the right place. Um, <clears throat> Varietal Literature is a group of Vancouver writers, of which I am a part of. And uh, yeah, Varietal Show is where we do live writing. Let me know how the sound and everything is, folks out there in the land. If you are curious about participation, there is a live chat. If you're not watching this live, though, and you just want to see the story we came up with or whatever else, there are always time timestamps down in the descriptions that you can uh, click to jump ahead to the parts you want to watch and the parts skip over the parts you don't. So what are we doing today? Well, we are going to do a simple thing. Well, at least in principle. Um, in that uh, we are going to look at postcard stories. Now, if you've never heard of postcard stories, you might know them. They are essentially the same thing as flash fiction. If you don't know what either of those are, <clears throat> it's very brief fiction. So um, a couple of things that mark it out is that it usually starts in the middle of action. It doesn't explain everything. It only gives you the pieces enough to understand its sort of core gimmick or story idea and ends without much fluff or anything. They tend to be two to three paragraphs at most, and they're not very long paragraphs. Now, the title of this video was about how it can help you write. Um, well, Gia says the sound is clear and also says those timestamps are the handiest. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I hope they help people for sure. Um, so why do I say that writing really short fiction is, is good or will make you a better writer uh, draws me back to one of my oldest um, lessons uh, that I are, like my, not my oldest, my most common advice I give to new writers. And it is this. <clears throat> the most ideal form of writing, which you should always kind of be aiming for, is Dick and Jane. You know, like, run, Jane, run. Run, Dick, run. Do the well, we go. Yada, yada. That's really ideal. Now, that sounds silly, and it sounds like I'm being kind of tongue-in-cheek. I'm really not being as tongue-in-cheek as you think, because I, I think for all the poetry and beauty that you can put in language, a lot of people, especially when they're starting out, can lose track of the fact that the main thing you're trying to do when you're writing is communicate pretty basic ideas like who's in the room, where are they in the room, and where are we in general? Well, there are things that are equally important when it comes to um, writing, like, you know, portraying emotion or character arcs and these more complex and refined things that artists really burrow their thoughts down into. The truth is, none of that matters if I don't know where anybody is, right? Like, um, or I can't keep track of like even who's who like those things are primary stage direction and location and weather and time of day and who's talking these are the fundamentals and run dick run and or sorry uh, dick and jane uh focuses exclusively on that so that young kids can follow it but I think a lot of writers could use that kind of discipline in their lives. So I'm going to give you an example. As I was sort of sitting here waiting uh, on the window, I was uh, just putting together a little postcard story as an example. I figured that might help. So I'm going to give you a little postcard story I wrote just now um, to give you an idea of what we're trying to do. Mr. and Mrs. Jones ran down their last potato, ran down to their last potato in a time of famine. Mr. Jones laid down to die, but Mrs. Jones said, We shall use my sister's witchy ways to call upon a spirit to help. So she drew a circle of salt, then pulled a great horned beast from a pool of fire. 
of fire, not pool fire. <clears throat> she begged for food to make it through the winter, and the beast responded, I, I shall grant you meat enough to see spring, Mrs. Jones. Then ran his sword clean through Mr. Jones' neck, saying before he left, Two wishes I've granted here today. There you go. There's an example of a postcard story. Um... You'll notice that, like, there's very minimal introduction. Pardon me, just having a drink. <clears throat> um, that there's just enough information that you can, like, get a sense of what's going on. You don't know where it is. You don't know the size of their shack. You don't know what kind of food it is or the cause of the famine. You don't know any of that. You don't even know their first names. You just know there's two people, they're married, and um, that's because those are about the only things you really needed to know to kind of get what the story was going to get you. <clears throat> um, and that is the essence, I think, of not just postcard stories, but of writing, which is why we're going to kind of play around with it. So if you're here and you're watching and you're curious, um, do... Uh, join in the chat. One thing you can do in the chat if you're not the kind of person who uh, really enjoys uh, too much like raw creativity or, or whatever else, like if that just kind of makes you nervous, uh, one thing you can call for is randomizing. So I'll show you a little bit. If you've been here before, this isn't anything new, but um, randomizing is, if, when you call for randomizing, I'm going to go to the Seventh Sanctum website, which is a bunch of randomizers for people who do tabletop games, but also people who just write. And you can randomize tons of things. Uh, magical beings, characters, combat, darkness, evil, humor, magic, media, whatever else. We are going to use that to um, get ourselves started here today on a postcard story. But my hope is that we'll get through more than one. But if well we're writing or if well I'm I'm putting down a story, you go, you know, I want to kind of mess with him. Just in the chat, tell me to randomize. I'll randomize something and we'll work it into this story, which is going to be particularly hard with postcard stories because they are lean. Um, and I'm sorry if I aren't am not able to do it with everything that I am offered. Okay. Uh, so that's that's the principles. We are writing basically very short fictional stories called postcard stories. We're going to look at how we choose the sentences we do if you're a writer who's interested in like what can you learn from it. Um, but for the rest of you, if you're just readers and you're not writers, uh, you can randomize or you can make your own recommendations about how things should go in the chat and mess with me because I frankly enjoy the challenge. Uh, it's a test of creativity. If anybody doesn't understand that, you let me know and I can review some stuff. But with all of that out of the way, that means that it is time for our lick game. Um, well, I don't know. Is it time for our lick game? Here, here, I'll do a really brief left on red. Um, left on red is... Um, left on Red is basically me recommending a book. Um, so it's books that we've left on Red that we think you might want to check out. Uh, and if you were here on the splash screen, you might not be surprised to learn that what I'm going to recommend you read is Farewell to Arms by Ernest Hemingway. It is a bit of a longer book and uh, it becomes a more and more personal story. But the first act of that book is heavily based on his experiences in war, <clears throat> in his youth, and um, has some of the most impactful and memorable and sober observations I've ever seen in writing on the crimes of war. And um, <clears throat> I think uh, that's what you guys should try and read. I mean, you can even find it for free online. That's a Farewell to Arms by Ernest Hemingway. It is a bit of a slog at times. But at the very least, um, getting through the first half of the book would definitely get you to the stuff that I think is worth reading um, from a person who was a veteran of the wars. So there's a very brief left on red. Go read Farewell to Arms by Ernest Hemingway, which means that now 
it's time for Lit Games. So once more, Lit Games is we're going to write very short fiction. If you want to randomize, just let me know in the chat, randomize or say something like that. And I'll go to the Seven Sanctum randomizer and try to work it into the story that we have. But that does mean that at this point we need somewhere to start. And as per usual, the place to start is the randomizer. So, um, let's do beings. Let's do a randomized being. There's an alien race name generator, an alien race generator, a cat guy and cat girl generator. That feels like probably a corner of the internet. That would get me views, but maybe not one I want to be in. Um, a dragon breed generator. Hmm, creatures. Let's try sci-fi. Alien race generator. <clears throat> okay, so I'll give you guys um, maybe like two or three options here. And then you let me know which one we need to write a short story about. This is just our jumping off point. The delicate looking semi-gaseous race that resembles the merfolk of Earth mythology. So mermaids. By tradition, they are a race of bureaucrats. They reproduce by butting off new members of their race. Their major technical achievements are in cybernetics. I don't think I've ever seen a cybernetic mermaid. It's a lot to build into a postcard story. They are a growing empire. The next one, next option, is the yellow-scaled race. They are tripedal. It's hard for me to picture what that would look like. They are omnivores, but prefer to be carnivorous. I mean, human. The color of their in integument changes with mood. Uh, that's a word I don't know, genuinely. <laughs> they reproduce by budding members off their race. Okay, that's not... They're masters of weaponry. They're very literal. Their government is a meritocracy. There's another race they worship as gods. They come from a different level of reality. That's a lot of things. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> the ferret-like race, they reproduce by butting off new members of their race. Is this like the only thing this randomizer does for reproduction? <coughs> they are merciless towards the weak, even among their own species. They come from another time. Okay. So, we have delicate semi-gaseous merfolk. A scaly omnivore changes color with mood and worships another race as gods that's an interesting concept um and uh the ferret like race they reproduce by budding members off of their new race i don't know if i would take that i think i might ignore that it seems inconsequential they are merciless towards the weak even among their own species they come from another time okay uh i see a vote for the ferret like race so why not um Let's just tag this story one. Whoops. Okay, so here's the thing. Here's the nice thing about postcard stories. If you're looking at writing in general, it's just the thing you want to do. And when I say writing, I don't mean you're looking for a career in writing. I just mean you feel like writing something and you want to do the best you can with it. Um, writing, I think, is a bit of a weird one. Like, people wouldn't question you painting. They would be like... Yeah, people paint as a hobby. That doesn't mean you're trying to get a job in it. But when you say you write, there always seems to be this expectation that you are going into it as a career, which is something that, I, you know, me and the other people in Varietal are, are aiming to do. But um, that is hardly the pa only path for this. So um, <clears throat> I would say... I, when I say, if you're thinking of writing, just keep in mind, I'm probably talking to you. Like, just as an average person who might be interested in it. So, story two. When we're putting together a story, this is the hardest thing to describe. Every story needs a, a gimmick. A, a, it's a punchline. Something to it. Right? Something, something like core seed of like, that's a neat idea right um and it varies widely what that's gonna be but uh 
to give an example of of that um the story that i have here the gimmick or the punchline or the thing that sort of justifies it as not just being kind of sentences about stuff that happened but maybe something a little more is this idea of you know if you reach out to a devil they'll help you but in this in this uh self-defeating way in this way that you're worse off than when you started for having taken their help it's not an original concept but it is a concept um and it is what the story wraps around so if we're going to do a story about this ferret like race um that are merciless towards the weak and come from another time we need an idea that is going to be easy to establish in a few sentences and wrap the punchline on it and by punchline again i don't mean like comedy hey look the spam's back hello spam i wonder if i get views from spam that'd be interesting wouldn't it um the um so with the ferret like people like it's tough to say whether you have a good idea or not i mean usually it's just about writing it and seeing how it goes um i uh yeah like i I think that's one of the things that I'm trying to get across with these streams is that, you know, it kind of, you kind of just need to, to write it. Like, you need to think a little less about it. Hey, Big Drew! Alright, let's report you. Unwanted commercials, man. Okay, so, so let's say the ferret-like race um, come from a different time, come from another time, hmm. They're merciless towards the weak, even among their own species. I'm going to pull in the text that we randomized here. Ferret-like race, they reproduce by butting off new members of their race. They're merciless towards the weak, even among their own species. They come from another time. Um, I like the idea that destroying the weak to be stronger ultimately weakens you like if i'm looking for a concept to play with and i think that um this idea of them coming from another time is interesting because maybe they're trying to get back to their time but their ethos has put them in a place where or maybe this is what the story is where they destroy everyone who could do that um, because let's face it, people who can build time machines usually aren't, you know, the strongest in the group. <laughs> um, so, let's say... <clears throat> the ferret folk, I'm not going to get stuck on trying to come up with a name for these people. If you guys want me to change it to a certain name, you let me know. It's a little big. But naming stuff is like such hell in writing, so I, I'm going to try and just skim over it. The ferret folk were desperate. Oh, no. Here. We're desperate for their... Oh, you know what? That's, that's a little bit too philosophical and reflective we want to put them in the action the ferret folk uh, uh how about this the tribal leader <clears throat> of the ferret folk kicked the scrawny scientist against a tree where he fell limp. Hmm. 
This is why... He announced to the crowd we remove such weakness from our ranks for their failures keep us from our homes So, why have I chosen what I've chosen? Well, first of all, we're in the middle of action, so we're in a scene. <clears throat> Second of all, you want to introduce as few characters as you can, but of course, you need more than one character, right? So, um, otherwise there's no conflict. Usually you need about three characters to have any kind of interest in the drama or dynamics. Um... So, we need to open on the conflict, because that's basically what a story is, resolving the conflict. Um, so, the tribal leader of the Ferret Folk kicked the scrawny scientist against a tree where he fell limp. That's the first sentence that we open with. Next thing I need to establish is that that isn't an abnormal behavior, because it is for us. That's a key thing to get across, so I have this leader say, this is why... He announced to the crowd, now we know there's a crowd of people watching that aren't intervening. We remove such weakness from our ranks, for their failures keep us from homes, from our homes. Now there's a really interesting idea, which is one of my favorite pieces of advice about writing, which is every sentence of a story should answer a question from the previous one, but present a new one, or at least, or start to answer it. <clears throat> now, obviously, you can't be that black and white about any advice, but the idea there is why is he upset? Why is he kicking him, right? So it starts with, why is he kicking him? Well, apparently, this is what they do with their ranks. The next thing is, <clears throat> why is he upset in the first place? Well, because his failures keep us from our homes. So then the next question is, why does a scrawny person, how is a scrawny person's failure keeping them from their homes? This is like how stories get built, is the writer, the reader should always be in a state of like, okay, well now I know that, but now I want to know this. <clears throat> um, Holly's House says she's here, but once again lurking in the shadows. Hello, Holly's House. Looking forward to having you back when you're able to. Um, okay, so... This is why he announced to the crowd, we remove such weakness from our ranks, for their failures keep us from our homes. <clears throat> um, nothing could bring us back to our homes, said the matriarch, eyeing the limp. Ferret folk with concern. <clears throat> Save an alteration to the flow of time itself. Now, I don't feel great about this because that seems, I mean, it does present questions. But it isn't very clear for how little space I have. Because I basically have a paragraph left. <clears throat> of space. Like we've already used up a fair bit. For we... We're thrown here by anomaly and could only return by miracle or great technology. I mean, it's a little literal, but, you know, you don't have a lot of space. <clears throat> Exposition is for when you don't have time to be indirect. 
Is exposition bad? Well, it depends. Is it something worth subtly stretching over 25 pages, or is it not going to be that rewarding for the reader, so you just say it? Or do you just not have the space in our case? Um, save an alteration to the flow of time itself, for we were thrown here by anomaly and can only return by miracle or great technology. Um... I said the tribal leader, but his devices have only failed so far. The matriarch leaned down. and felt the breast of the abused beast, then hung her head and said, by our ways, we are doomed to stay. For he was the last that could find us a way. <laughs> sure, let's make it rhyme. Let's rhyme way with stay and then stay with way. For he was the last that could find us his way, find us a way. And now he lies dead. I mean, we're kind of out of space there. I don't know if that's an amazing tale. Um, I don't think I've established as much as I want to, but uh, the tribal leader of the ferret folk kicked the scrawny scientist against a tree where he fell limp. This is why he announced to the crowd we remove such weakness from our ranks, for the failures keep us from our homes. Nothing could bring us back to our homes, said the matriarch, eyeing the limp ferret fellow with concern, save an alteration to the flow of time itself. For we were thrown here by anomaly and could only return by miracle or great technology. I said the tribal leader, but this device, his devices have only failed so far. The matriarch leaned down and felt the breast of the abused beast, then hung her head and said, By our ways we are doomed to stay, for he was the last that could find us a way, and now he lies dead. <clears throat> okay, let's see what chat came up with, because I know Big Drew's here. Uh, Big Drew said, the ferret people give us a half-eaten sandwich. It's a symbol of honor and respect in ferretdom, but comes with a curse that enslaves the entire race of its consumer. The Broodwitch, as it's called. <laughs> I like that idea. Where were you 20 minutes ago? Um, <clears throat> and uh, he also says, be careful, GS. Ferret meat is a hot commodity in some cultures. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Meat is meat, I imagine. Um... The, uh, story three. Okay, now the one thing you might have missed, Drew, is we have a randomize option that we've been working with for the last little while. And what that means is, um, at times, uh, you can call for randomizing while I'm writing or whatever else. And I'll randomize something off Seven Sanctum because there's so many randomizers here. Now, we did an alien species as a randomize. Um... We can do equipment for a randomizer. Um, uh, there's fantasy meals, there's candy, pizzas, science fiction tarot cards, technology, like science fiction medical tools. I find that's hard to base a story around. Firearms, swords, weapons. Yeah, I'm kind of curious about the idea of candy. We could do something a little more cheerful. Uh, Gia says, well, you did a really good job wrapping your story up quickly. Well, thank you. I don't know if I did, but I, you know, said something in a brief amount of time, and that's the point of a postcard story, is to have the discipline to say nothing more than what you need to to meet uh, the expectations of your idea. 
And the thing that I think why I say in the in the title of the video that postcard stories make you a better writer is because it reminds you that stories have to be about something kind of insightful or unique. Like, um, I guess they don't have to be, but I, I come from the school of thought that there's not really much point in writing a story that isn't. Um, there's a lot of like stories out there that frankly feel like they're pulled out of someone's journal. And there are a group of people that really enjoy them and good for them. But, uh, and it's not the style, by the way. I'm not against people writing sort of in first person about their feelings or whatever else. It's not in opposition to that style of writing. The thing is, do you have something unique to say? Is the story sort of leading us somewhere or is it truly just rambling? Um, and I'm not a big fan of like rambling stories like that, like that, I should say. I am a fan of sort of rambling styles of epic tales, if you will. But again, there's ideas in there that they're trying to get out. Big Drew said, I have no idea what happened, but now I want half a sandwich. Maybe you're tired, Drew. Being tired makes a person hungry. <clears throat> Oh, I see. Chat's already picking stuff out. Crispy Wacko Fudge. Crispy Wacko Fudge is pretty good. Okay, we could do something with Crispy Wacko Fudge. As far as like... Okay, so... If we're talking about... Um, uh, I don't remember my own layout here. As far as like if we're talking about... Um, <coughs> Crispy. I may never remember what I was trying to say, so I apologize to everybody for leading them on. Crispy Wacko Fudge. Was that it? Um, as far as, like, why does randomizing work? Um, well, another piece of advice I can give you is that all creativity is basically taking unusual things and trying to connect them. Um... You know, not everything works out great or, or sounds, you know, ends up being a good story or whatever, but I am a strong believer in why it doesn't really stress me out to come on here and use a randomizer live and write live is I'm pretty sure that I can come up with some kind of connection. And then, you know, if it's not amazing, it's not amazing. And if it's funny, it's funny. And that's entertaining. But at the end of the day, like, it's just sort of weaving together disparate things is, is, is how you make interesting stories. Um, <clears throat> you'd be amazed the things I've made stories out of. Uh, Big Drew says, ooh, GS is making the fraud babble. <laughs> um, and then he's pretending to be, uh, um, spam. Okay, so Crispy Wacko Fudge. Now, obviously, like, the story, the story that it makes, uh, Candy a central part of its plot is Willy Wonka. Um, which is nuts. As the story, I mean, if you've seen the movie, it was pretty nuts. But to be honest, like, you remember that scene in the original Gene Wilder movie where they're going in the boat down the Chocolate River and just out of the blue, it's like everyone ate mushrooms and it's going crazy? The whole book is like that with a strain of weird fascism in it. And, um, <clears throat> uh, but it's still based around the idea of a chocolate factory, right? Like, it's about the idea of a chocolate bar that gets you into a chocolate factory. And that's it. That's all you really needed to start that story. And then your kind of brain takes you the rest of the way. You know, you find, as Chuck Close says, you find stuff in the process. So, Crispy Wacko Fudge. I want a world where candy is going to be significant. So what would that look like to me? That That's where my first thoughts go. What kind of world would a candy be enough to make a dramatic statement or, or cause drama for people? Um, so GS says, yes, it actually makes you wacko. So then the question I ask myself is, I wonder why someone would want to make candy that makes somebody wacko. Um, I got half ideas. Sorry, I don't mean to give you dead air. I'm just sort of pondering that. 
like the 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 obvious thing to do would be like oh okay we'll make it like a, a villain who wants to make people wacky but i think i have a better idea and i don't think i'm gonna tell you what my concept is um but remember guys if you want you can say randomize uh we can randomize some stuff and add it in as we go but i'm gonna try and write the third story here crispy wacko fudge i was a mechanic in a town of mechanics we would often visit I was a mechanic in a town of mechanics. We'd often visit the engineers in the upper parts of town. All the villas all around. What buy our Toasters, vacuums, and cars. For none were better made. The only storefront on, on Main Street, the only storefront on Main Street that wasn't a stitch quilt of brown and gray boxes Machines of utility packed quite efficiently. Was a narrow hall with a counter run by an old hag. She sold but one candy called Whack Wacko Fudge. She sold but one candy called Wacko Fudge. That was what it was called, right? Yeah, oh, it was one word. <clears throat> All who ate it went mad, and none in town knew how she stayed open. One night I was looking at the stars and set again to counting them. For all things had an answer in calculation. But when I found I could make no sense of the numbers there were, the numbers of them. I went to the store and ate the fudge for myself. Then I understood there were no stars. To count. 
just the voids between. Now I stand on the corners and tell them leave it there okay let's see what other people came up with I got very philosophical here <clears throat> um, I see big drew has some stuff not gonna read all of it there drew nothing personal crispy wacko fudge is a post-war candy tycoon he craves the power once held by dictators and presidents as the creator of wacko fudge candies Chris had become a baron was craving an all-encompassing power over his subordinates and the town folks. Day and night he toiled in his massive factory until one day, when he finally created his mind control line, he would take on control over the consumer and make them subservient to him. And the crispy, then GS adds, and the crispiness was what made it irresistible to between them. Then GS says, voids between, that's heavy stuff. I think I just went wacko for a minute, yeah. Uh, I was a mechanic in a town of mechanics. We would often visit the engineers in the upper parts of town. All the villas all around would buy our toasters, vacuums, and cars, for none were better made. The only star storefront on Main Street that wasn't a stitch quilt of brown and gray boxes, machines of utility packed quite efficiently, was a narrow hall with a counter run by an old hag. She sold but one candy called Wacko Fudge. All who ate went mad, and none in town knew how she stayed open. For who would invite madness? For who would prefer madness? It simplified nothing. And your burdens would remain. <clears throat> One night I was looking at the stars and set again to counting them, for all things had an answer and calculation, but when I found I could make no sense of the numbers of them, I went to the store and ate the fudge for myself. Then I understood there was no stars to count, just the voids between. Okay. Good job writing a happier story, Rory. Um, story four. And that means it's time to go back to the randomizer. Um, okay, so we have a few things here. We have darkness and evil, combat, equipment, humor. I really, I'm curious what our humor options are here. Because I, I don't understand how that's going to work. Um, okay, so we have... Action animals? Time for those hard-hitting yet insanely cute animals and animal likes we know from cartoons. I'm not too sure what that is. I'm assuming that's an anime thing. Um, humorous fantasy classes. Well, that's that's interesting. Uh, some of this stuff is pretty specific. Wacky classes and wacky gadgets. Um, oh, the grimoire of questionable spells. Oh, I, I mean, I gotta at least look at it. The astounding transfiguration of athlete's foot. The flaming sphere of drool. The great right of the stunt double. The hermetic chocolate beam. The illusory, illusionary chant of grumpiness. The illusionary halitosis globe. The illusionary incantation of incontinence. Infernal incantation of constipation. <laughs> Overwhelming chant of onion dip. <laughs> Prismatic yogurt taurus. Sawdust blob. Shield of mouthwash. Speak with groupie. Storm of belching. Ultimate warp of dandruff. Those are some good ones. Um, and then I also wanted to look at... What was it? 
um, fantasy classes. Oh, oh, it's not what I wanted it to be. It's classes for like D and D, um, which I do play, by the way. Uh, Grimoire of Questionable Cells. Uh, yeah. I'm going to generate more because as much as those are funny, none are, are amazing to me. The amazing invocation of the accountant, the astounding invocation of Toe Jam, the astounding invocation of the wannabe, blob of piles, call female impersonators, <laughs> cure foot fetish. <laughs> that got me. Cursed enchantment of vinegar, dispel hummus entity. I mean, that's going in the maybe pile. Flaming evocation of batter. <laughs> Induce complaining in tap dancer. Luminous puddle of blathering. Occult ceremony of the pudding devil. I mean, that's probably it, isn't it? Sphere of hair, syrup glob, unholy spray of flatulent. I'm, I'm putting in my vote for the occult ceremony of the pudding devil. I don't know if chat has any preferences. <clears throat> yeah that was the other one i was looking at gs says luminous puddle of blathering um maybe we could use both they're both pretty good whoops There we go. Whatever. <laughs> okay, everyone said Pudding Devil. That's good. Because I, I feel like that was the best one as well. Um, okay. No, no. Come on. Come on. Sorry, I have a glitchy mouse here. All right. Um, okay, so... That is no... Luminous puddle... And I hear no blathering wizard apprentice Rory <laughs> screeched the old man. Why did I... Wait, let's take the apprentice out. Wizard. Great wizard Rory. Why did I pay two silver shillings for a person that would confuse a summon of a puddle for an occult ceremony that now haunts my puddings with devilry. Offended, or maybe... Uh, <clears throat> the young wizard stuttered uh sorry feigned offense by stuttering through his glued on gray beard.
No, no, no. Good, sir. A wizard's ways are mysterious, but always successful. Perhaps you wanted a luminous puddle, but you needed bedevils, bedeviled puddings. The puddings. We're crawling. With red horned creatures no bigger than a thumb. They liked the chocolate more than the, the vanilla. But in all, the man needed a luminous puddle for a dance floor. And the wizard he hired was creeping for the door. Big Drew says, does Roy fancy himself a young peer of Harry Potter fighting a semi-solid tapioca Voldemort? <laughs> tapioca Voldemort's pretty solid. <clears throat> Creeping for the door after ruining his puddings. Are you just a boy? He said in shock, seeing the beard peel away. Nay, said the boy. I am a man. Who knows? <laughs> Who learned well to bedevil puddings and little else. If you had asked your neighbors, they'd have told you my s of my skills. But I did, said the man, and they endorsed you. For it is my son who is marrying their daughter. Then I dare say, said the boy running from the door away into the street. They endorse nothing about you. There you go. Not my best. <clears throat> and definitely the longest. Um, okay. 
Well, why don't we go back and read what we came up with? Oh, actually, I see Big Drew came up with something here. Oh, no, that's the thing I already read. Okay, so, story one. <laughs> Big Drew says, wait, maybe it's deviled pudding like deviled eggs, but a pudding top custard or something. Probably would be. I just feel like uh, it's hard to... It's definitely hard to make that into a full concept. Let's read through what we did today, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. Uh, so story one was the one I wrote just before we started, actually, uh, as an example. Mr. and Mrs. Jones ran down to their last potato in a time of famine. Mr. Jones laid down to die, but Mrs. Jones said, We shall use my sister's witchy ways to call upon a spirit to help. So she drew a circle of salt, then pulled a great horned beast from a pool of fire. She begged for food to make it through the winter, and the beast responded, I, I shall grant you meat enough to see spring, Mrs. Jones. Then ran his sword clean through Mr. Jones' neck, saying before he left, Two wishes I've granted here today. Story two was based on the ferret-like race, and it... Said so was the tribal leader of the ferret folk kicked the scrawny scientist against a tree where he fell limp. This is why, he announced to the crowd, we remove such weakness from our ranks, for their failures keep us from our homes. Nothing could bring us back to our homes, said the matriarch, eyeing the limp ferret fellow with concern, save an alteration to the flow of time itself. For we were thrown here by anomaly and could only return by miracle or great technology. Aye, said the tribal leader, but his devices have only failed so far. The matriarch leaned down and felt the breast of the abused beast, then hung her head and said, By our ways we are doomed to stay, for he, has the, he was the last that could find us away, and now he lies dead. Then we got story three, which was based on the concept of crispy wacko fudge. I was a mechanic in a town of mechanics. We would often visit the engineers in the upper parts of town. I hate that he used town twice. All the villas all around would buy our toasters, vacuums, and cars, for none were better made. The only storefront on Main Street that wasn't a stitched quilt of brown and gray boxes, machines of utility packed quite efficiently, was a narrow hall with a counter run by an old hag. She sold one candy called Wacko Fudge. All who ate went mad, and none in town knew how she stayed open for who would prefer madness it simplified nothing and your burdens would remain one night i was looking at the stars and set again to counting them for all things had an answer in calculation but when i found i could make no sense of the number of them i went to the store and ate the fudge for myself and then i understood there were no stars to count just the voids between And then story four was the one we just did. That is no luminous puzzle. I hear no blathering. Great wizard Rory, screeched the old man. Why did I pay two silver shillings for a person that would confuse a summon of a puddle for an occult ceremony that now taunts my puddings with devilry? The young wizard feigned defense by stuttering through his glued-on gray beard. Now, 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 good sir. A wizard's way are mysterious, but always successful. Perhaps you wanted a luminous puzzle, but you needed bedeviled puddings. The puddings were calling with red-horned creatures no bigger than a thumb. They liked the chocolate more than the vanilla, but in all, the man needed a luminous puddle for a dance floor, and the wizard he hired was creeping for the door after ruining his puddings. "'Are you just a boy?' said in shock. He said in shock, seeing the beard peel away. "'Nay,' said the boy. "'I am a man who's learned well to bedevil puddings and little else. "'If you'd asked your neighbors, they'd have told you of my skills.' But I did, said the man, and they endorsed you, for it is my son who is marrying their daughter. Then I dare say, said the boy running from the door away into the street, they endorse nothing about you. Uh, GS says Wacko Fudge needs to be a psychedelic song. Yeah, like, um, oh, uh, why can't I not think of their name? Jefferson Airplane song. Uh, there's some talk about ferret pudding. Big Drew says Satan's evil potato <laughs> equals story one. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been fun, guys. I hope this has been a delightful distraction uh, from what is uh, a day that could probably use some distraction. 
Um, I have been Rory. Um, this has been the Varietal Show on Varietal Literature. If you want to read stories by myself and other Vancouver writers, check the description. There is always links to stories down there. Varietal-literature.ca is the website if you prefer. Uh, follow us on uh, Twitter and Instagram at varietal underscore lit. And uh, Tuesdays we read mm, fairy tales and folk tales. Every Tuesday there's a whole playlist called Fireside Fairy Tales. Same time, but on Tuesdays at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific and 9.30 Eastern and beyond that, I don't know. Um, and thank you so much for coming by and writing stories with me, GS and Big Drew. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here because the shop is closed. Thank you very much. Now get out of my shop.